Alex. Okay, so let's get started. Um, so welcome everyone to the Merge and Polymerase call number seven. Um, first, congrats on the girly fork. Uh, this is one, uh, this is yet one more step towards the merge, uh, which is great. Uh, okay. So we have uh, not that tight agenda today. So it's going to be relatively fast. Uh, we'll go through um, a few updates and uh, we'll discuss plans for uh, Q3. Um, then finish with uh, some random discussions or probably spec discussions. So I'll start with implementation updates. Um, everyone, I'll start from myself um, as usual. So I've been recently working on the prototype of the transition process. Um, the, the spec of it have been merged, the part of the spec of it have been merged, has been merged like um, a couple of weeks ago. So it's been implemented in Teku. I played uh, with it um, in the local network. Um, a, few th a few things I would like to share about this um, testing. Um, I've tried it like in a positive test scenario and the negative test scenario where the block uh, proposer tried to produce blocks before the computed transition total difficulty uh, has been reached. So it went well, um, but obviously uh, we need more thorough testing uh, with more mass um, on the network side, like uh, withholding um, the um, proof of work blocks by part of, uh, by some part uh, of the nodes of the network and then releasing them and so forth. Um, also one thing mm, to bear in mind here is that uh, I used local miner. So it's a uh, result, it's like in a high fluctuations of uh, block time intervals. Um, and um, yeah, one of the goals of the uh, total difficulty computation is the predictable merge time, but uh, yeah, that was that wasn't like uh, checked uh, well in locally because of uh, the fluctuations. So it should be like checked like with some real miner, um, which can produce more um, hash power. So that's the update from my side. Um, but anyway, uh, the prototype uh, showed that the algorithm in general works, um, which is great. Um, any questions here? Um, Very nice. How do you think is best to test um, some of these more complex scenarios? For example, like a partition in the network for you know, two epochs after uh, the, hitting the transition difficulty and, and, and things like that. Um, do we have anything in our toolkit to, to test that kind of stuff or do we need to build out some custom stuff? Mm, that's a good question. Uh, if we, I was uh, thinking about simulation, like simulating the network mm -hmm. stack, if we want something, some, some predictable uh, scenario uh, and uh, so we can like uh, have some parameters of the mass uh, that we want to have in, on the network layer. Um, no, I don't think we have any tools for that. Yeah. So probably we need could to do one. on the consensus side, we, we could write fork choice tests that essentially like a chain is being built and then another chain is revealed with different difficulty and stuff. So there's a little bit we can do there in kind of an isolated fashion that we should, but yeah, simulation probably makes sense for-, for Yeah, yeah, right. Uh, um, yeah, probably um, I've been correct uh, saying this simulation of the network part. Yeah, what, what you have uh, just said is what I was thinking about just uh, to stop uh, the network layer with uh, some predictable 
um, network, uh, network layer with uh, which can be managed by um, by some process um, fire messages um, according to some time intervals or something like that. Yep, so it needs to be done. Also about, yeah, these uh, fluctuations, um, I don't know, um, I've been watching like, uh, do we have like the uh, stable time intervals on the, um, I don't know, on the Robston, for example, the block time intervals? Sorry, what about the block time interval? Um, are they like stable on the Robston? I mean, is it like really, um, I, I mean, more uh, like st uh, stable in terms of uh, the difference between the mean time and... My understanding is it kind of depends on the day and who's mining okay. on it. Yeah. But I would suppose more stable than what you were doing locally. Yeah, we'll see. Okay, so I guess we can move on. Can the, having, yeah. given that Cleek still uses total difficulty, can can this um, what you've written be anchored on Gorley or Cleek network relatively easily? Uh, interesting thought. Because if so, that would give you good good block time. <laughs> right. Block time. Um, it, yeah, but... it probably is worth considering if that can be ported pretty easily. I think because it uses total difficulty, it should be able to be. Um, just because we do have some test nets, we will want to fork off with Gorley. The one catch with predictability on Gorley is that an in-turn block gets a difficulty of two and an out-of-turn one gets a difficulty of one. There's a lot of out-of-turn blocks. So you uh... kind of halving or doubling your difficulty a lot. <laughs> okay, gotcha. Yeah, thanks Thomas on the information on, on their option, let's see. So let's bear it in mind and get back to this question a little bit later on how to check the predictability. Um, and yeah, the, yeah, this historical data on difficulties could be pretty um, valuable. Cool. Okay. Um, any other implementation updates? That anybody, anyone wants to share anything? Yeah, I think okay. it's primarily London and Altair. Yeah, yeah. Makes sense. London and Altair. Okay. Yeah. Let's go to research updates. Um, a couple of PRs that have been announced uh, on the previous call, uh, which are the cleanups in um, in the Beacon Chain spec by Justin and uh, Eden uh, Randall failed uh, to the execution payload. They have been merged. Um, so, um, cool. Uh, also, I've been like a bit looking into the current implementation of consensus JSON RPC. Um, let me share the doc. Uh, this is rather a problem statement. Then the particular uh, proposal on how this JSON, oh, on how the, this uh, consensus API should look like. I got a, got a 403 forbidden on that doc, if you can open it up. Oh, sorry, really? Um, let me open them up right now. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Let's see. Now it should work. Yeah, if I'm in. Cool. So, um, so let me give you a bit of a context on that. We have the consensus JSON RPC implementation, which we used for Ryanism. And it worked well for the purpose of Ryanism. Um, and it could probably work well in production. 
but uh, some of us uh, were suspicious about that, that it's like production ready thing. Um, and uh, here is like a few arguments uh, contributing to this, uh, um, um, like, uh, okay, so just, yep. Yeah, and um, the main question here is um, if we, um, go with the JSON RPC based uh, consensus API, um, which has some restrictions and which lays some restrictions on the use cases. Uh, we might probably want uh, to replace it at some point in time in the future. So the main question I would ask and the main question that this document states it, uh, is that whether we are ready to develop some something, uh, some new communication protocol uh, before the merge, or should we uh, take an easy path uh, right now and uh, like um, think about it and do it um, later? So that's the main question. Um, I can go through the problems just briefly that I have found in the current implementation and the design. And before that, I would say, whatever does actually get implemented is probably likely to be very sticky um, in terms of difficult to replace once it's in production. So I would, I haven't read through this doc yet, but if there are actually problems, I suggest we fix them soon. Micah has his hands up. Yep, that's Micah. I just just a quick question. Did we answer the question from a few meetings ago as to whether this needs bidirectional communication or unidirectional? Like, is it always request from one end to the other end with a response going the other direction? Or sometimes does the other end need to initiate? Um, I see. And uh, this document denotes uh, some cases where the bidirectional communication is needed or highly desirable. So, okay. yeah, this this is one of the also design considerations, right? So we Boom. use the, sorry. Oh, sorry, go on. Yes, please go ahead. Yeah, I mean, the, the only other, or not the only, another big question to answer is whether we want to go to REST instead, since that's what the new clients use. Um, Right, and okay, there isn't like subtopic in this talk also. Oh yeah, let me just go to the uh, problems um, and yep. Um, I'm not, uh, I don't think we will come to any uh, conclusion or any solution and, at this call. And this is just a food for thought for uh, the next uh, calls and next minutes. Okay, so the first um, mm, the first problem with the existing protocol uh, will lack. We seem to lack one of the messages that will uh, tell the execution client that the beacon block, uh, the consensus of this beacon block, is valid, is validated, um, which is um, obviously required uh, because if uh, the execution payload of invalid uh, beacon block will be stored and served uh, through the user's JSON RPC to lead to some bugs in the services and software. Um, so we need this message. We need this explicit message uh, because uh, we also have a set head message that um, tells what is the head of the chain, but uh, um, not every block is becomes the head of the chain after it get import, gets imported. So we need a separate message to signify that consensus is valid. Um, so essentially a commit after initial processing. Right, so it will look like uh, the new payload is sent to the execution client, it's being processed and uh, while it's being processed, it will receive this uh, new type of message that this pay, that uh, the beacon block, the consensus block of this payload is valid or is invalid and then 
the payload will be either discarded or uh, persisted uh, after the processing. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, the next thing is uh, we will, uh, we have like several messages that are causally dependent, like a new block, um, like new payload and the set head and this um, new type of consensus process, uh, identity, um, consensus process message. So, and the uh, current protocol relies on the assumption that all causally dependent messages will be uh, the order of all causally dependent messages will be preserved on the consensus side and on the execution uh, client side. So they will, they need to be pipelined, uh, which is um, like, which is just bug prone. So we might want to reduce, uh, we might want to just release this assumption to get rid of it. And in order to do this, we will have to uh, this um, like execution client will have to store some state of um, of the messages received from the consensus client. Like if it's received the new payload, it can then uh, receive this um, um, set head or uh, consensus process messages, and the order of these messages uh, will mm, will not be preserved. Then it can um, gather it in from, uh, gather uh, this whole information in this kind of state in this kind of cache, and then decide what to do with the, the payload. So this is one of the things. Also, uh, the next one is HTTP overhead, which requires the new connection each time the request is being sent. Also. Um, uh, we can't do asynchronous uh, communication with HTTP only. We can do this with uh, some kind of techniques that allows for this. So we might want to use something like WebSockets, um, which opens a way uh, to bi-directional communication. And like the last use case uh, is a failure recovery. Uh, let's assume that the execution client just crashed and it, it uh, and the consensus client stored persisted some block uh, while the execution client doesn't have uh, the failure for it, for it. So the payload hasn't been persisted. So it starts up and uh, uh, with the, and the consensus client will send like the next block, uh, the block uh, uh, which uh, execution client doesn't have a parent for. So, and it will, and according to the current state uh, of the arts, it will, the execution client will have to go to the network to pull the state um, and to continue the execution, which is suboptimal. We might want to, um, like, for more, we might want to look at more optimized scenarios where, like, the execution client starts uh, and sends uh, the status message with the head of the chain to the um, consensus client. Then, consensus client decides what to do. If this gap is only one or two blocks, it can replace those blocks uh, without making execution client go into the network and so forth. Uh, also, and um, yeah, and the last, like th that was the last use case. Um, and the overall um, thought is, um, would be great to have it extensible. So uh, in the future, so uh, yeah, it would be great to design a protocol that can be extended with new messages, with new use cases, uh, without need in designing the new protocol because we have some restrictions. Um, that's it, that's it. You, you said that for the failure recovery, the execution client can go to the consensus client and ask for the last two blocks. Does the consensus client keep? Um, it can send uh, the message and say, uh, here is my head uh, and consensus client can decide what to do. It can ignore this message and execution client will have to go to the network to pull the state or to pull those two blocks. Um, I think yeah, the idea is, is yeah. that a, a consensus client might store like the last few blocks in memory or something. And so you can opportunist optimistically ask, hey, by the way, do you have this? Cause I know you're local. If so, give them to me. If not, I'll go find it myself. Right, right. This 
this kind of um, behavior is what could be like more optimal than just going straight to the network. Does, um... okay, yeah, that's fine. Um, yeah, it, even if it's these blocks are not stored in the memory, they are stored in the um, database, so they can be replayed. But not the bodies, right? You still have to go to the network for the bodies? Um, no, the bodies are also stored. Am I not mistaken? No, so the, I mean, the bodies are certainly in the beacon block, uh, but yeah. you could imagine using the execution engine locally to store the bodies. So you don't have uh, redundancy there, but. And, I mean, we already have a state blow problem. This feels like we're doubling that. Is that, am I incorrect? Like if, if the consensus client and the execution client are both storing full blocks, full bodies, then the only difference is just the state, which is only like, you know, a quarter, a third, or whatever of our total state blow problem. Um, I I guess that at some point, um, like uh, beacon block clients will not store blocks beyond the weak subjectivity checkpoint. Ah, okay, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, the failure recovery case is one of the. Um, cases that depends on the bi-directional communications. And also, it could be a sync process. We can, if we need some rich uh, scenarios for state sync, we could, it could also be relied, it could also rely on the bi-directional communications. communications. Right, I think the one thing missing from this document is potentially messages required to communicate during state sync. Yeah, it's been mentioned like in the last section, but just briefly. Okay, gotcha. Explicitly say it. So, just one small comment from me that um, each HTTP request requires its own connection that is avoidable. There are ways to have persistent HTTP connections. Not sure if every library we are using supports it, but. I uh, see, I see. Okay. Yeah, so um, we can use web sockets, which is which is already yeah, but, supported by yeah, I see, I see. Yeah, but even even there's a keep alive uh, in HTTP one uh, header that allows you to keep the connections for until the time's up. Oh, I see. Cool, cool, cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great. Um, good point. I was uh, thinking about HTTP two, um, but it's yeah, but why not to use web sockets as they are already yeah, supported I, by clients? I feel like web sockets is like my gut tells me, given the like the problems you laid out, um, web sockets is probably seems like the way to go, just because it's easy. Like yes, you can do HTTP keep live, and it's not too hard, but people aren't familiar with it. Libraries often don't support it out of the box. So you have to you know fiddle some bits. Um, web sockets are just kind of just out of the box. They'll do exactly what you need. Um, they'll keep the connection alive. They'll let you know when the connection dies. Um, the connection won't die randomly, like with uh, like you could have a timeout in theory with an HTTP. Uh, just uh, keep alive, um, and they give you, you know, that bidirectional communication. So you don't have to just open. You don't have a have, you don't have to run an HTTP server on both um, clients. You just have, you know, one of them is a server, one of them is a client. That's how you establish the connection, and then it just runs from there. So maybe one, you... oh. one last comment from me, uh, HTTP to connections are also persistent, but I agree that web WebSockets are probably better for our use case. Um, maybe you mentioned this is one of the reasons, another reason that you might want bi-directional here is async processing of insert block so that the execution layer can tell you once it's done rather than you waiting. Right, yeah, that could be can be done with HTTP, uh, yeah, like servers and events techniques, or anyway, yep. How long is that uh, expected to take? Kind of in the worst case scenario, like how async is that? You're talking how about long hour, does it take to process an each one block? 
Okay, so like 250 milliseconds, order of magnitude. Yeah, and maybe like the worst DOS block is 10 times that. Yeah, sure. Okay, I was wondering All if right. it's like, are we, we have to worry about like HTTP timeouts kicking in at two minutes or something. Yeah, no, I don't think so. So maybe that's not a, actually a design use case. Um, so, but is, uh, is Gary's comment correct in that that's the primary reason that we want bi-directional is the uh, failure recovery case? Mm, yeah, but potentially other cases that we okay. might not identify this far and uh, yep, uh, asynchronous um, communication would, yep. So what, what would be implemented with this bi-directional communication okay. channel as well. Um, also, uh, I don't wanna speak about this today, but uh, if we will um, looking into redesigning the protocol, uh, we might also want to look into encoding, so JSON um, is also gives an our head, so it better be some binary encoding, and then we can ask whether to use SSZ or RLP or whatever else. Um. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think that's an important consideration that we already have like two protocols that follow the same thing, which is basically talking between components. Um, and the more we have, the more we increase that security surface and audits become tricky. And it's just annoying to write a client. Like it's, it, it, if we have web sockets, JSON RPC, HTTP REST, uh, and maybe gRPC, somebody will soon mention, um, that's a burden for developers, right? Isn't the idea yeah. here, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, that we're this conversation like WebSocket, JSON, RCP, or whatever would replace HTTP REST in the consensus client or no? So there's the user facing APIs, which are defined in that RESTful HTTP, which I there's see. this is independent of that and should be discussed independent of that. But the fact that that exists in the stack already. Yeah. Um, yep. Uh, oh, one question from me about the payload size uh, wouldn't uh, it's a question so i don't know wouldn't it be even like better to keep it as uh, json but just enable some compression methods than rather than uh, doing binary uh, not sure which one would produce smaller payloads um yeah also good point because we deal with a lot of numbers, binary will almost certainly um, be smaller just because JSON numbers are gigantic because they're strings. Um, that being said, JSON does compress a lot and you get, do gain a lot by compressing it. Yeah. It, yeah we do, do web sockets uh, support like something like any, ah, oh, yeah, okay. So it could be on top of web sockets. Yeah, web sockets is just bytes on a wire. You, you can compress web sockets uh text messages with gs with gzip the support in servers was a bit hit and miss but that was a few years ago um and yeah it it's surprising what you can get away with when you gzip json like very surprising i used to do market data over json yeah be careful about discussing modifications to the payload format to something that's kind of that's opaque um, if we don't necessarily need it. So I'd want to see some numbers before we swap, swap that. Yeah, I mean, the other thing is in the standard API, we've started using the accept header to negotiate content types. Um, so you can get an SSZ formatted block or state, for example. Um, right. But the default is, like is JSON. And that's really useful to be able to upgrade and say, hey, I support SSZ. And I want to save some bandwidth or whatever. Does anyone have an argument against JSON or sorry, against WebSockets here? I see a lot of people saying Jazz WebSockets sound great. Does anybody disagree with that? I think it's probably a good fit here. The only concern I've had with WebSockets in the past is that it doesn't always go through. I've always done WebSockets with a with a plain HTTP fallback because inevitably you find firewalls and things that just don't do the WebSockets upgrade or kill off the connection regularly. Um, but I don't think that's really a design consideration for us. 
um, that's a kind of more public website type stuff. I'd, I'd just echo what Yasik said and adding another thing. I, I think that we should work through the design considerations that Mikhail has placed forth here um, and at least fully validate that we really need the bidirectional um, before committing to taking on another protocol. So WebSockets, I believe, are implemented in all clients right now, all major clients. Uh, for the JSON RPC endpoint, you can do WebSocket or HTTP. Gosh. So I, I don't think, if we're just the WebSocket part, I don't think we'd be adding any new technology. Um, if we did like REST over WebSocket or something new, or I guess REST over WebSocket, maybe not quite. Anyways, if we did something new on top of WebSockets, um, that might be new. But JSON over WebSockets is already on known the execution models. engine. Uh, yeah, that's true. That's true. Yeah, the execution yeah. engine only. Yeah, but uh, libraries that are to implement clients of uh, JSON RPC um, are supporting WebSockets, I guess. I mean, like Web Web3J, J, for example. I'm curious, Yasek, do you all have WebSockets implementations in in them uh, and on the Nimbus ETH one side? Uh, yeah, we do. I mean, it's it, it's not a problem that way, really. It's more that it becomes an incredible zoo. Like, uh, <laughs> I mean, all right. So, so, so you want to use this beast, right? And then you have to have a WebSocket server running and an HTTP REST server running and an HTTP JSON RPC server running and a Dev P2P port and. Um, a lib P2P port and the discovery v4 port and the discovery v5 port and that's well it shouldn't have v4 well <laughs> you know <laughs> so, okay. so i mean that's six already uh, and i just ripped them off the top of my head and right. uh, and that's where the complexity lies it, it it's just difficult to uh or not difficult it's it's just a lot for even the user to manage and set up and Imagine the firewall rules for everybody and blah, blah, blah. So, so, I mean, it's not really a question of which libraries are available because I, there's a ton of them, but each library also brings in its own dependencies, uh, own configuration complexity, um, the overhead to learn those frameworks, really, like the ins and outs and the details of web sockets versus plain HTTP versus rest over HTTP, which has a different framing and so on. Like that, that's more of what I'm talking about, like the um, complexity overhead in general, not, not whether a library is available or not. I, I agree with yeah. all those, the latter point you made. Um, for the first point though, I feel like even if we did HTTP here, you should still be exposing this on a different port than the public facing JSON RPC stuff. So at, at least for the firewall stuff, you will need a new port, I believe. Or you should have it. I agree with the latter half of what you said, though, that it does increase complexity, just adding another frame. Yep. Thanks, everyone, for your valuable inputs. Um, I guess we should think more about it before um, making any decision and look forward to the use cases, to potential use cases that we might see in the future before we are buying in with uh, one or another solution. Um, what can like, a, so, yeah, what can re a little bit reduce the complexity of design and implementing this protocol is that these two parties that are communicating via this protocol are going to trust each other. So, but I don't think it reduces it significantly. Uh, my two cents on Danny's question as to whether we need bidirectional or not. Um, again, my gut feeling from the conversations I've been overhearing is that there's enough situations where we think it would be valuable that it feels like eventually we're going to need it. Like it's one of these things where, sure, you could argue that any of the individual examples, you know, we could get a, we can get away with not having bidirectional communication, um, but they'd be a little bit better with bidirectional. But I feel like there's enough of those that, like my 
my my background tells me that eventually that's just going to continue to pile up and you're just going to end up making sacrifice after sacrifice after sacrifice if you don't have that bidirectional communication. And whether that's long-lived HTTP or WebSocket or whatever, I think matters less, but I do feel like bidirectional is, again, just from what I've been overhearing, feels like the right way to go. I guess the question here is like, um, isn't kind of the future that the the execution client um, becomes more and more minimal in its feature set, like um, will more and more just be there for uh, verifying blocks and maybe producing blocks. So I guess like, I wonder if that is really true. Like if, if we, if the long term isn't different, like, it, like, should users really long term rely on the ETH1 um, REST API, for example, to get their data? No, like, I mean, they should use one API and that's probably the ETH2 API because uh, that's the only one that can get you consensus. Yeah, but uh, there is a lot of, there is a bunch of um, API that's exposed by execution clients. So, um, and I guess a lot of services are using it will not be easy to replace uh, one with another or to move it to another endpoint and uh, another protocol. I mean, I think like we'll just have to do it long term because like if we don't do it, then like it will always be like, I mean, it's always going to be pretty weird. Like why, why do I, do you really think in the long term users will want to install like two separate pieces of software, configure them and so on. Like one of them should be really, really minimal in my opinion. And just like be more like a library than, so, um, than a piece I've of software that install. What I've envisioned, which I know not everybody agrees with, is that um, over time, many years, we will probably move into more pieces, not less, but they will become packaged better. And so from an end user's perspective, you double click an installer or whatever, and it installs you know, three pieces of software, like three services on your host. You don't know that because you're a user and you just double click the thing, but there's three pieces of software. And one of those pieces is like a, basically like a reverse proxy. It's just a thing that you connect to as a user. And then that connects to the two backend pieces. Um, this would be the more traditional architecture. Um, and I think packaging matters a lot there. Like we do want it to package into a single double click for users, but for more enterprise focused customers, you know, they will benefit from having those individual services that they can talk to separately. Yeah, I, I agree. I guess I disagree in that. I don't see why, except for compatibility reasons, you'd want to talk to the ETH1 client directly in the future because you care about not about some random state, you always care about relevant state as an in consensus state when you ask questions about Ethereum. And so it doesn't make much sense to me in the future so think, to ask if one client, except that's the, if that's the only thing you can do because you have been written before this existed. So I, I think the, the primary reason I would want to do that is because each client has different feature sets that are added on beyond the base feature set. And the, you know, your execution client may have a particular features that you want, like tracing or something that other clients don't. And because it's not a standard feature, you can't access it through the um, consensus client. Like you need to go directly to your client because it's added a special feature just for you. Or Nethermind, for example, has plugins. And so I can write a plugin for Nethermind. The consensus client knows nothing about that. And so if I want to talk to Nethermind, I have to go directly to it. Yeah, not to, I mean, and the execution engine would have, like, does know what the head is. So for many of the things that you do on a query, it does have an idea of consensus in that sense. But again, I want you to package this up nicely and have just kind of a standard proxy to get, get to it all. Um, I think the, the common end user doesn't really have to think about it. Yeah, right. So every execution client will be accompanied with consensus client, which is, which is, uh, which is this driven by. Um, yeah, also for this uh, use case is probably where we need the consensus um, um, data as well. So it could be like the unified facade that can request data from the consensus and uh, combine them with the data from the 
execution clients. Potentially, this is one of potential design solutions here, and then get back it to, uh, with this data to the user. So it will be one interface. It will does all the things. Okay, so um, let's stop here. Um, thanks everyone again for this discussion. Um, okay, do we have any other research updates? Okay. Okay, like uh, let's move to the plans for Q3. Um, this is the first day of Q3. I think it was um, like share, so, like uh, speak about plans for a little bit because we're expecting London in a month. Uh, we're expecting Altair in a couple of months, right? Or something like that. And uh, with uh, all this in mind, we're expecting um, more focus on the merge uh, during this quarter. And uh, regarding the plans for this quarter, we have, uh, um, okay, so we so far we have like uh, beacon chain or consensus specs are in the feature complete state. So definitely there will be some refinements, bug fixes and some additions. Um, like on the network spec and uh, if the API uh, changes as well, uh, but in general, uh, we have the design, we have the transition process so far, um, and it makes sense uh, for Q3 to focus on the execution client specs, uh, on the EIPs, on the consensus API. Um, that's what we are going to do in this quarter. Um, also, um, would be great. I think we will have uh, the more test nets coming in the second part of this quarter. So that's the uh, high level overview on the plans. Yeah, I think. Okay, that, you know, um, yeah, I mean, the consensus specs will also rebase on Altair relatively soon, and also integrate um, London changes the execution payload, which I think would include something related to fifteen fifty nine. Um, and also figuring out standard, how we're going to be testing. I think we already have uh, consensus side test vectors being generated. We'll be extending that um, and then figuring out how the execution layer leverages the existing tests and extends them in this new context. Uh, I think that's something important to figure out in Q3. Yeah, I totally agree. We need that. It's like by, by default, all the EVM stuff should just continue and they should operate independently. But I think we just need to kind of touch it and make sure that we're happy with the way things are structured. Yep. Also, um, at some point, um, we are going to stop making the separate merge calls. Um, probably we'll have one or two um, after this one and then go to. Um, and then we'll keep discussing merge uh, during the all core devs um, and the proof of stake consensus um, call dependent on the part which has been discussed, which is going to be discussed. Um, yeah. So that's how that plans. That's yeah, Mikael and I've been working on a check, like very high level checklist of all the things that will share soon and probably put in the PM repo. Yeah. Okay. Um any questions or suggestions to the plans? Great. Um any spec discussions? Actually, we already have one. Okay, any other discussions? Cool. Does anybody want to say anything else before we wrap up? I'm good. Great.
Okay, thanks everyone. Um, see you on the different places soon. Um, I will not make the next call, uh, the stake call. So I'll see you. Thanks everyone for coming. Thank you. Bye bye. Thanks, Raquel. bye. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Cheers. Hey, hey Danny, is it possible? I think I already leave. Uh, <laughs> I just wondering if it's possible to have the same um, Zoom server for both calls since they're back to back, just be a little more convenient. Oh, uh, I see. Uh, okay, actually, uh, this is like a, um, a link provided by us, like Cahadus. So it goes in there, and the call that Danny manages it is from Ethereum Foundation. So they may have different links. It's not a huge yeah. deal if it's complicated or hard, just would be convenient. <laughs> right. This yeah. goal will be deprecated soon anyway. So one or two more times. Yeah, that's true. Uh, okay. I, I do have the new link I believe Danny sent in the morning email today. So I will ping you, Micah. Okay. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thank you. Everyone. See you later.